Good morning. A special welcome to each of you, and uh, we are very blessed and privileged if you are with us for the first time today. We want to welcome you and pray that you might be blessed as we continue to bless the Lord this Sabbath day. So welcome. Welcome to each of you. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 this morning. Matthew chapter 26. You will notice in your bulletins um, we have... uh, Place in the bulletin the servant leaders that, uh, that serve us here at the church, our elders and our deacons. And just to say once again, we had our AGM a couple of weeks back and it's just exciting to, uh, to be able to welcome onto our eldership Roy and Judy Sinclair. We thank the Lord for them. Roy has, ser- has been serving in the diaconate these last couple of years. And to also uh, welcome onto our diaconate uh, Steve Martin and Maria Scrovia. So it's great to have these men together with the existing leadership and ask that you would pray for our leadership as we seek God's guidance um, and as we seek God's leading for his church. I do also just want to mention this comes a bit late but Mark and Haley Tyndall uh, I haven't made mention of their son uh, Daniel. Um, how old is Daniel now Mark? Five months hey? Um, so Daniel comes along right there in the spun of all those uh, uh, little boys that have been born Okay, we're in desperate need of uh, lots more little girls as well, so that we can balance these things out in about 18 to 20 years' time. Okay, so Shannon and Kirsty, no, uh, no pressure. Okay, but, uh, but we just praise God for, for young Daniel. And also, uh, there has been one girl that has arrived this last week, uh, and a uh, little girl by the name of Sophie was born to uh, Martin and Ruth Rickberg this week, so we rejoice at the arrival of, uh, of young Sophie. Okay. Just a quick update um, on uh, Tim and Di. Those of you who don't know uh, or, or haven't been here for a while uh, or, or at BBC for a long time, uh, just to bring you up to speed, Tim Tanz is one of our elders here at Baptist Bible Church. Uh, his wife, Di, three weeks ago was diagnosed with, uh, with lymphoma. Uh, a week and a half ago, she had her first chemo treatment um, and uh, has really struggled, as one would expect. Um, and so, Lord willing, they'll be home uh, later on today, um, and so we just pray that Di will be able to rest up, get the rest that she needs, and gain her strength back before returning to South Africa in 10 days' time for her second treatment. Uh, so all in all, uh, it's going to be uh, eight treatments that she will undergo. And so on behalf of Tim and Di, um, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Thank you for, their su- for your support to them. I've been on the phone with Tim a couple of times, and, and he just wanted me to thank the church family. And we just continue to pray uh, for Tim and Di. And so they will be coming home, folk. And, and if I can just ask if we would just, uh, I, I'm sure there are a number of us want to just be in touch with them, and that's great. Uh, but if you want to pop around for a visit, if I can kindly ask if you would maybe just give them a call first, uh, just to make sure that she isn't resting. She needs to rest. She needs to get her strength back. And so I, I kindly ask, please don't uh, just, just drop by uh, um, unannounced, but just um, give them a call first. And, uh, and I'm sure they would love a visit, but won't you just call them first? So just continue to pray for, for Tim and Di. Okay, let's bow our heads as we, as we pray this morning. Abba, Father, thank you that you embrace us in your love. You enfold us in your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are because... Uh, Because of you, Lord, we are a redeemed people. And Lord, thank you that we are not a hopeless or a helpless people. That even as we have woken up the Sabbath day, Lord, it is one day closer to heaven than we have ever been before. Thank you for the hope and the promise and the victory that we have because of the finished work of the cross. And so, Lord, as we come in, in, in every state and every condition that you find your people today, Father, thank you that we serve a God who is alive, a God who is victorious, Lord, a God who is moving us heavenward. So even in our heartache, even in our struggles, even in our pain, Lord, may we be so mindful of your great love, so mindful of the finished work of the cross, so mindful, Lord, that, um, the, the, that the temporary troubles and agony of this world will soon pass when that new day will dawn, Father, and, uh, and Lord, we will enjoy eternity with you where there will be no pain, where there will be no suffering, Lord, where there will be no struggle or hardship, and we will forever worship, Lord, before your throne. 
But until that day, thank you that you empower us and enable us by your Spirit to persevere. And so, Father, I pray that even this morning as we would look at your Word, that, Lord, you would make our eyes to see, that you would make our ears to hear, that you would make our minds to understand and our hearts to receive your Word today, that we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And, Jesus, I pray that I would be nothing, that, Holy Spirit, you might be everything in this place. Lord, that I would decrease that, Lord, you might increase, I ask. And all for the glory and honor of your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. And amen. So, church, we, as we get started, we've been looking the, these last few weeks at what it means to be the church. Uh, we've been looking at what it means for Christ to exist in community what it means to, to do church, to not simply go through the motions of church, but what does it mean to do church? We've been looking at, uh, the, uh, at the model of the early church as we look in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Word of God tells us that they continued uh, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. And so these last few weeks, we've taken time to look at, uh, at a biblical approach to fellowship, uh, the writer of Hebrews reminds us to forsake not the gathering of the saints uh, as some are in the habit of doing. And so we've looked at a biblical approach to fellowship. That our, our challenge and our call is not to simply do church on a Sunday, but to do church every day of the week. So we've looked at biblical fellowship. We've looked at uh, prayer and the gift of prayer and why God has given to us the gift of prayer. And then last week we looked at... Um, and how important it is, especially in these last days, that we hold to sound biblical teaching, to sound biblical doctrine. And so this morning, as we, uh, as we approach God's Word, we want to focus on a practice which runs the risk of becoming nothing more than a religious habit. And it is that of communion. And so, um, as, you, as you, you may well know, the first uh, Sunday of every month, uh, we celebrate communion together the first Sunday morning of every month, and then the third Sunday evening of every month, we have an opportunity to celebrate and to partake of communion. So the heart of the message this morning is the greatest meal yet, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 at the greatest meal known to man thus far. And so we want to read from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through to 29. Once you follow with me in your Bibles this morning? I am reading from the New King James Version, but follow in your, in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. Matthew writes and says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, He blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Verse 27, And then He took the cup and He gave thanks and He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed. For many for the remission of sins... But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so the heart of the message uh, this morning, church, is that, uh, here's, here it is, that the, what the old covenant could not do, Jesus Christ did through the new covenant. What the old covenant was incapable of doing, Jesus Christ did through the new covenant. And so as we get started this morning, how often are we mindful whenever we partake of communion? How often are we thoughtful whenever we partake of communion? How many of us have a biblical understanding of the gift of communion and what it represents and what it speaks of? As we look at, uh, at the historical background of, uh, of what's going on here, uh, on the night before his death, now understand as we study uh, Jewish tradition, Jewish living, we find that a, a day would begin at sunset. So really what's taking place here is Jesus is getting his disciples together um, at sunset, which is the night before the following night, which would be Passover. Okay? So Jesus draws aside, it has already been prearranged uh, for them to meet in the upper room, and he draws aside with his disciples the night before Passover is celebrated. Not long from before he would go to the cross for the sins of the world and, um, 
And even at that time, people are coming into Jerusalem, they're flocking into Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. And it is a reminder, and you can, you can read it in Exodus chapter 11 and, and 12, what takes place. It is a reminder of how God rescued and set His people free from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And so God looks upon the plight of His people as we look at Exodus, and they're under the, the strong and the firm iron fist of Pharaoh. And so God sends a series of plagues to turn the heart of Pharaoh in order that he might agree to let God's people go. And so plague after plague after plague does not result in any moving of Pharaoh's heart. And eventually it results in, um, in God giving instruction to Aaron and to Moses, tell the people to find an unblemished lamb, at twilight they are to slaughter that lamb and sprinkle its blood on the doorpost and the lintel. The lintel is the cross beam or the horizontal beam that you find over doors or over windows. Tell the people to sprinkle the blood of the lamb over the doorposts or over the lintels of the building. And anyone who does not do that as the angel of death sweeps across, the firstborn in every family will die. And so tell the people to sprinkle the blood over the doorposts and the lintels of their homes. And so Passover was a reminder of how God had rescued and set his people free from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And we can get uh, part of the story of the year, and thus you shall eat it, you shall eat the, 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 uh, the, the roast lamb, the Passover lamb, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you as a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance, is what God says to His people through Moses and through Aaron. And so God instituted Passover as an annual celebration to recall and to remember how He rescued His people from bondage and slavery. Unblemished lambs were slain, fresh blood was sprinkled year by year, and each generation was taught the lesson of freedom that came about the, the shedding of the blood of the lambs. And so the Jews were gathering in Jerusalem at this time to celebrate Passover. Two days before this account here, Jesus says in, the, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 2, the Son of Man will be, will, will be delivered up to be crucified. And so Jesus is setting the stage here as we look at the preceding passages here in, uh, in Matthew chapter 26. There's the, the religious leaders are plotting to kill Jesus. Uh, Mary comes and anoints Jesus for burial. And then we find Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. And then we get into the upper room where Jesus is with his disciples. And so uh, verses 26 to 27, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. And here's what he said. He said, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he said to them, Drink from it, all of you. Now, first thing we need to understand, when you came together to celebrate Passover, when you came together to remember God setting His people free from bondage in Egypt, this was not something somebody would say. You wouldn't just make this claim, this is my body. No one ever did that. No one ever said that. This was out of the ordinary. Okay, it was odd for any of them to hear somebody say this. In fact, what one would say, according to Jewish tradition, what one would normally have said when they sat down to pass over and they passed the bread is, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. That's what they would say. And you're sitting in the upper room that night, Jesus begins to teach his disciples, he says, this is my body. Eat it. And this is my blood. Drink it. Now I want to make something very clear here. There is a, a school of thought or, or belief uh, that is called transubstantiation. It's actually what, uh, what the Catholic Church holds to. And what transubstantiation means is uh, people hold to the idea that whenever we partake of, of, the, of the bread or of the cup, that those elements become the actual body and blood of the Lord. And that's not the case, okay? 
as Jesus instituted the Last Supper, it was merely to be a reminder. These were symbols, these were emblems, these were elements of, uh, of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so as Jesus is uh, having this meal, and understand, folk, uh, yes, it, it's, I guess it's changed uh, in, in the contemporary church, and now we come around and we eat the bread and we drink of the cup, but this took place in the context of a meal, just a fellowship meal, an everyday thing that takes place in our homes. And Jesus turned this meal into a celebration. And when Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, what Jesus was actually saying is, I am God. And so this, this big celebration that's going on, everything that you have heard in the Old Testament, everything that you know to be from the Old Testament, everything that you've ever heard and ever celebrated is about me. Everyone who will be celebrating Passover not, not long from now will be celebrating me, is what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And right there in the, in the upper room, Jesus takes the Passover celebration and he institutes uh, the Last Supper. And what he actually does is he institutes what we know today to be communion or the Eucharist. And so these are the final hours. Jesus is with his disciples, minus Judas, who has already betrayed him and gone his way. And they get to share together before his death and before, uh, 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 before the Passover meal. They get to, to remember uh, the, the liberation of God from Egypt. And Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, you, you, as I said earlier on, you, you wouldn't say these kinds of things at Passover. No one would dare make these claims at Passover. But what Jesus was saying in that moment is, I am the fulfillment of prophecy. What Jesus was saying is, the entire Old Testament is about me. Everything you've learned, everything that has been passed down to you through the ages regarding Passover is about me. Everyone who's coming together over this time and will be gathering in their homes and will be having this celebration meal is all about me. It's all about me. And so here we find with the Passover meal, we find that every historical, every uh, th theological idea is being followed true to history. And, and then Jesus comes and he introduces a model which we are to follow as his believers until he returns. And so what Jesus was actually saying to his disciples that night as he took the bread and as he took the cup, what he was saying from this moment on, whenever you, you, you partake of the meal, whenever you partake of the bread, whenever you partake of the cup, remember me. No longer do you need to look back to that time in Egypt. No longer do, does that need to be the pivotal point. Egypt is no longer going to be the pivotal point. Calvary is going to be the pivotal point. Moses is no longer going to be the person that you remember when you think of this meal, but I am going to be the person that you remember when you think of this meal. And Jesus was turning it inside out and right side up and bringing the understanding to them. No longer will you look back to the blood that is sprinkled that was sprinkled on the doorpost. No longer will you look to the blood of the lamb that was sprinkled on the, lint the lintels of your home, but you will look to the blood that will be sprinkled not many hours from now on the cross of Calvary. That's what you're going to look to. And that's the significance of Passover. Not many hours from now, redemptive history is about to undergo transformation that will impact the course of human history forever. No longer will we be looking back to Egypt and God's rescue of his people from, 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 from slavery uh, or bondage to slavery, but he's going to be rescuing his people from bondage to sin. And church, as we celebrate communion, that's what it is. It is a celebration of a Jesus who has rescued us from bondage to sin. And so that night marked the dawning of a new day. No longer will humankind look to the old patterns. No longer will humankind look to redemptive types, and we find lots of redemptive types in the Old Testament, but, the, but, but humankind will look to the person of Jesus Christ. And church, understand, you know, up until this point in time, up until this point in time, through the years, there would have been millions of lambs that would have been slaughtered, animals that would have been killed, Blood that would have been sacrificed. Blood that would have been poured out. And yet not one sin would have been covered up until this point. Not one sin. This huge amount of blood that would have been sacrificed and yet one sin, not one sin, 
had been covered up until this point in time. Jesus was making clear to them, drink of this because it's only my blood which is going to be able to cover a multitude of sin. If we study Exodus chapter 24, we find that the old covenant was sealed by the sprinkling of the blood of a bull. It was a covenant that depended on keeping the law. And how well did the people do at keeping the law? Not good at all. How well do we do in keeping the law? Not good at all. And so it depended on the people keeping the law and that didn't last long at all. They were not able to keep the law. But when we come to the new covenant which Jesus is making, it is a covenant of forgiveness. It is a covenant of reconciliation based on what Jesus has done, not based on what you and I could ever do. Amen, church? It was based on what Jesus Christ had already done. The forgiveness is, is secured by offering His own life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And that's why Jesus says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Up until this point in time, covenants were ratified by blood sacrifice. And Jesus says, But I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, going to usher in, I'm going to usher in a new redemptive plan here. And it's going to be at the expense of... Of my own blood. John MacArthur says this. He says the memorial of Christ's death and the deliverance it brought was to supersede the memorial of Israel's deliverance under Moses. And sadly, sadly so, that's, that's, where, that's where the Jews miss it. Is is as they backtrack, as they go back in time, and as they remember the Passover, they, they miss the most significant part of it, which is the Lamb of God slain for, from the foundations of the world for the sin of the world. And so what Jesus was doing here is he was marking the end of what we understand to be the Mosaic dispensation. Everything that was hinged in the teachings of Moses. And he was ushering in this new era through his blood sacrifice. When Jesus talks about this new covenant... So we talked about the old covenant. The old covenant had to do with animal sacrifice. The old covenant had to do with my ability to keep the law. My ability to follow all of these commandments. And yet he ushers in this new covenant. I want to share two passages of scripture. There are a number. But I want to share two passages of scripture with you. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 to 34. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. He says, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And this is God getting real and this is God getting intimate and this is God getting close to his people. No longer is it going to be this long list of commandments that we dismally fail at. But God says, you know what, I want your heart and I will write my, my, my laws, I will write my commandments on the tablets of your heart. And I will change and I will transform and I will draw you into relationship with myself. And I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin and I will remember their sin no more. And what part of this new covenant was doing is up until this point in time, there were the chosen, the cherished people of God, which were the Jewish people. But this moment in time, in the upper room that night, what, what Jesus Christ was saying is, I'm reaching out to everyone. Jew and Gentile, Gentile alike, come, because grace is for all. And then uh, if you go to Hebrews, and, and the writer of Hebrews talks about this very passage, he makes reference to this passage, but he goes and he says, but now he has ob obtained a more excellent ministry. This is Jesus Christ. Inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And so we find that the first covenant was inadequate. It was incapable of rescuing men from their sins. And so Christ ushers in this new covenant. And so um, as we study uh, Jewish tradition, whenever you would come together for Passover, some of you here have had the, uh, the privilege and the opportunity of, uh, 
of, of attending a Passover celebration here uh, with Lawrence and Madeline. Lawrence has done teaching. Uh, hopefully I'll get this right, Lawrence. But when we, when we celebrate Passover, when the Jews celebrated Passover, there were four cups of wine from, from which they would drink. And those four cups of, of wine would remind them of four promises. Firstly, there was the cup of sanctification. And the promise was this, I will bring you out. And then the second cup was the, the cup of plagues. And the promise was, I will set you free from slavery. And the third cup was the cup of redemption. And it was this cup that Jesus was, uh, was drinking with the disciples as he instituted the Passover or, 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 or the Last Supper. Is that right? There, I'm getting a thumbs, thumbs up from Lawrence there, so I'm on track. The third cup, the cup of uh, redemption. And then the fourth cup would be the cup of completion. And, what the, and the declaration of the cup of completion would be uh, God saying, I will make you my own people. And it was this cup, the fourth cup, the cup of completion, which Jesus did not drink on that night in the upper room. It was to, to this cup that he was referring when he says in, uh, where are we here? When he says in uh, Matthew 26, verse 29, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now, on, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus went as far as the cup of redemption. And he said, I'm not going to drink the cup of completion right now. Why? Because church, we're still moving toward that time. We move, we're moving toward that messianic banquet. It's a ba banquet which is better known as, um, as the wedding supper of the Lamb. In fact, uh, Anthony Gunning shared a good message on that uh, uh, some, some months back in, in, uh, in April. If you, if you want to get a hold of that, it's actually on our webpage, uh, baptistbiblechurchzim.com. And he taught in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so this was Jesus making reference here, I will not drink the cup of completion because the messianic banquet is still to come. And here's what uh, it, it actually John is talking about in the book of Revelation. He says here, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And when we talk about the wedding supper of the Lamb, we're referring to that point in time when those who are dead in Christ will rise, when those who are taken up by the rapture will, will, will ascend and, and, and will forever enjoy eternity with Jesus. And Jesus will seat us at the table not as guests but as His bride. And when that wedding feast comes, church, we're not going to be guests. We're going to be the bride of Christ. And He's going to be our groom. And He will array us in fine linen. And He will array us in righteousness and, com and completeness on that day. And then He will sit us down at that table, at the banqueting ta table. And then we will drink the cup of completion. Lawrence, have I got it right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> he has no choice. He has to say yes right now. And then we will celebrate with Christ in His kingdom. Tell you, yes? Did someone say something? Amen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Praise God. I thought Lawrence was, uh, was saying something there, hey? And we will forever enjoy the presence of our Lord. Amen. And, and you know, Louise, I was, just, I was just thinking today, we will sit down at that banqueting table and Donnie will be there with us. And we will drink the cup of completion in the presence of the Paschal Lamb of God. And every, every believer who has gone on before us and every person who has placed their faith and their confidence and their trust in God, we will sit down at that banqueting table and we will drink the cup of completion. And Satan will be dealt that final blow and he will be given his final sentence and he will be, and, 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 and he will be uh, thrown into the lake of fire and, and, uh, and we will not know of sin, we will not know of suffering, we will not know of struggles, we will not know of death. Aren't you excited about that day? Amen? 
How many of you are excited? Put your hand up if you're excited. You know, and, and I was thinking about this, and I don't want to get all morbid, and I don't want to get all gloomy, but you know what? Things cannot get better in this world. It can't. Things have got to get worse, and things have got to implode, and things have got to collapse, and things have got to take a path of degradation. That's the path that it's going to take. Things are only going to get worse in this world as men become lovers of themselves and haters of God, taking on a form of godliness, but denying the power they're in. This world, church, is only going to get worse. So quit hoping it's going to get better. Is that too morbid for you? But it's going to get worse. And as that's getting worse, I want to tell you that heaven's going to seem sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Because the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has planned for those who love Him. In other words, you can sit for days on end and you can have the wildest imagination possible and you still won't come close to imagining what heaven is going to be like. Isn't that exciting? So you can think of the, the most beautiful place, uh, the, 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 uh, the most solitary place, a place of, uh, of solitude and peace, a place of tranquility, and you still will not come close to getting a taste of what heaven's going to be like. And so church, that's why you know, I say to people who uh, struggle with this idea of getting old, I've got no problem getting old, because you know what? God is taking us heavenward. Our young people are sitting and saying, I do. Okay? Um, there's no problem. We're moving heavenward. And all of this is going to fade away. And one day we're going to sit at the banqueting table as the bride of Christ. And then he's going to say, you know what? Let's drink this cup of completion. And finally, finally, it'll all fall into place as it should. Every question you have, every uncertainty you have, every struggle you have, every piece of the puzzle that's missing will suddenly all make sense and will all fall into place. And not this side of heaven. And so John gives us this vision of us sitting at the banqueting table, the wedding feast of the Lamb with Jesus and his bride. And so friends, as I close this morning, on the night before his death, Jesus took his disciples, drew aside into the upper room, and he instituted for them a movement from Passover to communion. A movement from an attempt to obey the laws to surrendering our lives to Him. A shift from looking at what the blood of millions of lambs could not do to what mo hours, not many hours from now, the blood of the true Paschal Lamb of God would accomplish. What the old covenant was incapable of doing in saving humankind from their sin, God would do under the new covenant through the blood of Jesus. And friends, as we celebrate the table of the Lord, and I want us to remember this, church, pay attention here. As we celebrate the table of the Lord, it is not a tack on. It is not something we just add on at the end of our uh, Sunday morning meeting on the first Sunday of every month or the third Sunday evening of every month. And, we, and we, must, we, must get, we must get away from that. I've been encouraging people as I've been fellowshipping with people and connecting with people. I've been challenging people. You know what? Get together with your friends and have communion often. Sit down to a meal today at lunchtime. I dare you to turn that fellowship meal into a communion celebration. Cell groups. I encourage you when you get together with your cell groups, often. You, you, you know, sometimes we wait. We find reason. Oh, today's the 4th of October. It's reason. No, no. We don't need to find reason. Jesus has given us reason enough. Just, just get together and say, you know what, let's, let's break bread, man. Let's turn this fellowship meal into a celebration. That's what Jesus did. It wasn't a, a separate thing. So when you get away from here today and you go have lunch together, I challenge you, go, go have communion together. Stop and remember the body of the, of the Lord. Stop and remember the blood of the Lord. When you get together tonight, I dare you to go have communion together. Whether it's a, over a pie and a Coke, stop and have communion. Are you guys going to do that? Yeah? Don't lie if you're not. Don't say yes. And so, church, here we find in Matthew chapter 26, the greatest meal yet. But I want to tell you, there is coming that day when the greatest meal ever is going to be celebrated. The greatest meal ever is going to be enjoyed. And you can be sure 
You can be sure about that. You can count on it. The greatest meal ever. It's still to come. And so let's run hard. And let's be true and let's be faithful. But let's not keep that news to ourselves, church. Because as we talk about the, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, as we talk about the dead in Christ rising, as we talk, talk about the rapture, we also need to understand that there will be those who will be left behind. There will be those who do not know Jesus. There will be those right now who are not headed toward the banqueting feast, but rather headed toward an eternity without Jesus and we need to be telling people about this. And we need to be telling people that there is a banqueting table to which they have been invited. And there is a place setting with their names and that's the way God desires it. And we need to be telling people that. Don't just keep this to yourself. And so this morning we are privileged and we are honored that we can celebrate communion together. But remember where it came from. Remember as God rescued His people from, uh, from bondage to slavery. And Jesus came along and said, I'm going to rescue you from bondage to sin. A place where the, the blood of uh, lambs was incapable of saving. And Jesus Christ came and said, my blood's going to save you. So friends, as we partake this morning, let's remember Calvary. Let's remember that blood-stained cross. Let's remember those hand pierced, uh, the, those nail pierced hands and feet. Let's remember that pierced side. Let's remember what Jesus did for us. And oh church, don't let this become religious. Don't let this become habitual. But let it become mindful, thoughtful, honoring. Whenever we come together. Let's remember. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, we know that in and of ourselves we are incapable of being set free from sin. In and of ourselves we are incapable of being reconciled to a holy and a just and an upright God. Jesus, we want to thank you for the establishment of the new covenant. We want to thank you, Lord, for your all-encompassing grace, for your love and your mercy and your kindness. We want to thank you for rescuing us from sin. Maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't know this rescue and this redemption. We can know that today. Maybe there's somebody here today who's not headed toward that banqueting table. But friends, you can be. And it's recognizing, that, Lord, I'm a sinner like everyone. That I have missed the mark. It is in repenting and confessing of our sin. Making a declaration of faith in Jesus Christ. Getting to know and understand His will for our lives. And living in a way that honors Him. And when we do that, He invites us as His bride to come and take a seat at the banqueting table. And together we will drink of that cup of completion as God establishes us as His own very people. And oh Lord, what a great day that's going to be. But until that day, may we be found to be true and may we be found to be faithful. May we remember often, Lord, and may we remember with reverence your body and your blood. May we remember Calvary. May we remember the Paschal Lamb of God. Slain from before the foundations of the world. Jesus, we honor you. Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you. In your holy name. Amen. Amen.